I'm recording now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I want to and take if you can of this one too. I love this one. I like them all now. I'm getting very attracted to them. Sometimes I just have some images in my mind. Sometimes it's images I've been dreaming about, actually dreaming about. And I wake up and I go down to, to the easel and I start to make these things happen. Uh, sometimes with a chalk outline um, on the white canvas, I use a blue chalk to do the outlines. Sometimes it's because I've been looking through art books and I have a special penchant for modernism and postmodernism. Sometimes something will click. Sometimes a color combination, for example, a certain way in which gray goes with red or a yellow goes with black. Somehow it just strikes me. And then some else, somehow, I make shapes. It could be bottles, it could be clouds, but somewhere in my mind the shapes have to do with the colors and how they fit together. I've never th stopped thinking about painting. I wrote for Arts Magazine, I did lots of reviewing, looking at painting, looking at painting all the time, and I was there at the very good, interesting moment when pop art was becoming, becoming important, and I wrote about the, those artists, and I, loved, I just loved being in the studio, and I loved looking at the painting all the time. Then a few years ago, I started making color drawings, and I told Roy Lichtenstein, who was my old and close friend, about them, and he said, let me take a look. I showed him my little book of drawings, and he didn't do what people do, mostly. They just sort of browse through it and say, that's nice, oh, that's great, nothing like that. He just looked at it, each one carefully. And then at one, he stopped and he said, Fred, this is beautiful. And I almost cried. I thought he, I said, don't, you don't have to say that. He said, no, I mean it. And then he started to talk about what he thought could make these drawings better. And it was important to me, very important to have his confirmation, to have his affirmation. And I began to make drawings, more drawings, more drawings, and eventually I had a drawing show in East Hampton uh, at Harper Gallery, and it went very well. And the gallery represented me as a consequence. And I had a show, of solo show of paintings about a year and a half ago. I guess it was 2022. I want to devote that rest of my life, whatever it is, whatever portion I have left, to painting and drawing again, but painting essentially, and, and learning more and doing more and taking more chances. The wonderful thing about it all for me is that when I began to do the paintings and the drawings, I did it with a certain kind of recklessness. I mean, a wonderful recklessness, because I thought, I have nothing to lose. Uh, I, I, it isn't as if I don't turn out a painting and make next million dollars. I can't keep my house going. I mean, children paid. I had nothing to lose except to, nothing at all. So I could do what I want. That's a great freedom. And so whatever I did came out in a certain way that didn't look like anyone else's work today. And that makes me very happy. That doesn't mean it's good. I, I don't have a fantasy about that, but it doesn't look like anything else. <laughs> and I, and I, I don't care to look like anybody else, either in my writing or my novels, my fiction. I just want to do the work I really want to do without threats over my head. There's no consequences. If you stop doing that, then you really stop making art. You stop making, you become something else. You become a commercial product. You make a brand, whatever you do. I don't know. I don't care. It's the interesting things that make it, that have longevity. So for that reason, I mean, there's certain periods of Picasso that I'm crazy for. And it's because his colors are so muted. I still haven't reached that point. I'm afraid. I'm a little afraid yet to try it, but I want to try it. You know, one of the most problematic things I think about painters especially, and writers too, they reach a point where they become known for a certain kind of work. And they keep making that kind of work because if they have success and they have a good life, <laughs> then why not maintain it? I don't want to do that. I mean, I can afford in time not to do that, that is to say. Um, if I had 50 years, I might consider that an alternative and, and enjoy the pleasure of it or the commercial value of it. But I, I just want to learn, learn how far I can go and what chances I can take and what skills I can acquire. Someone said to me, a painter friend of mine, wonderful artist, uh, actually, David Sally, he said to me, Fred, why don't you try every day practicing by drawing something from nature, like a tree or a person or a table full of 
bottles, whatever, to try each day to do it. And at first I thought, you know, because I wanted always to perfect my drawing, which is incredibly childish. I mean, my drawing is like my handwriting. It's just absolutely inane. And I thought, that's a good thing to do. I'll try that. Maybe I'll improve. But then I thought to myself, improve what? What will I have improved that I can learn more technically how to make something look on the surface of a, a, a page or a canvas look more representational? Is that what I want to learn? No, I want to learn, but I'm not wanting to learn what's taught, or used to be taught in art schools, you know, the model, the figure, the form. I would love to be able to do it, just to have the pleasure of doing it, the pleasure of the skill of doing it. But I, that's not going to happen. I have such a strange idea, Millie. I had it when I was a kid, very young. I thought that all artists and poets and writers were in a certain great collaboration with each other against the world. I thought, there's the world, cruel, commercial, uncaring, competitive. And, but then there are artists. <laughs> and we're all in the same world of trying to make something beautiful. I thought that was the mission, to make something beautiful, something noble, if I use those words. They seem so young and immature. But the truth is, I still feel that way. So when I see work, when I say I don't, I like all artists, when I see work that I think is glib, not striving, not taking chances, just facile and acceptable and welcomed, I couldn't care less. I could not, and that's true for fiction, it's true for poetry, I could not care less. You know, Melville said something so wonderful. He said, I prefer a failed novel that dives than one that stays on the surface and succeeds. As a, the well-made novel as opposed to something strange and different and quirky and not commercial perhaps, but something that tells you that the person doing it is reaching for something, is striving to find some kind of element of beauty or truth or something. Van Gogh only had 10 years. <laughs> so if I can have 10 years, how do I know what will come out of it? It could be wonderful. <laughs> you just have to stay with it, that's all. But it's really time that is the factor for me. How much time I have and how much I can do in the time I have. But anyway, I'm going on too much about this. The lives and loves and opinions of Frederick J. Tutton. It's hilarious. I have spoken. <laughs>